Hello, hello to our Fabrica online community and hello to our artists in residence at Fabrica. This is Carlos Casas, the program director. Uh, we welcome all to our second lecture from our new program, Other Worlding. I'm really, really happy to introduce our guest today, one of the new generation of artists, writers, curators and researchers that are shaping our world. And I'm happy and honored to have her lecture Ways of Worlding in our series. Alice Bucknell is a North American artist and writer based in London. Her work explores interconnections of architecture, ecology, magic, and machine intelligence and the non-human. Using film and gaming engines, her works proposes new understandings of the complexities of our world pushing new visions for the future and the future worlds we want to inhabit. Her work has exhibited uh, in internationally in places like the 17th Venice Architectural Biennale, the Bloomberg New Contemporaries, the Hit New Institute, the Fiber Festivals, uh, Ars Electronica, the White Cube and the Serpentine Galleries. Her writing appears regularly in art, architectural and design publications, including Flash Art, Freeze, Harvard Design Magazine, Moose, Pinup, and Architectural Review, to name a few. He, she has recently been included in Kuda Magazine Generational Issue, uh, a survey that investigates some of the most meaningful protagonists of the new generations who are shaping the landscape of the present and the future in contemporary art. In 2021, she established New Mystics, a platform for collaborative exploring the interconnections of magic and technology. And she recently organized New Worlds, a series of talks, screenings, <clears throat> and performance at Somerset House Studios in London, a collaborative platform exploring magic and technology and the interconnective topics of sound and ritual, myth making, non-linear storytelling, ecological futures, and more than human narrative. It is a real honor to welcome you to our Fabrica in large community, and really thank you for accepting our invitations. Please welcome Alice Bucknell. Thank you so much, Carlos, for such a generous introduction. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here today. Um, Thank you, Fabrica, for the extended invitation. And it's really wonderful to share with you some of the research ideas and topics that have been underpinning my practice for several years now, um, and no doubt resonate with the current theme at Fabrica on other building. So before we get started, I will go ahead and share my screen so I can pull up my presentation. Great, so let's begin. This is a talk about some worlds, from science fiction to simulation arts to philosophy and the worlds that exist within my own art practice. It is a talk about the circumstances and ideas that seed these worlds and the cosmologies and the speculative futures that they contain. This is also a talk about worlding what is worlding exactly? I like to define worlding as a critical and creative practice, which is to say both a practice of survival and a practice of imagination. Worlding holds multiple possible futures and pasts together at the same time without imposing anthropocentric distinctions or hierarchies. Worlding is a practice of deep listening to and with other narrative voices, human, non-human, ecological, alien, machine. Worlding is a method of storytelling that abandons the idea of the singular narrative voice. It's a practice of remaining open and permeable to the unknown elements inhabiting these worlds. Worlding recognizes its constantly changing nature, as science fiction author Octavia E. Butler suggests in her Parables series, as its only constant. 
these worlds are always on the move, always creating new offshoots. To speak about worlding, we also have to speak about words and happenings. At the intersection of words, which is to say language, and at the intersection of happenings, which is to say time, stories are created. And as Ursula K. Le Guin tells us in the carrier bag theory of fiction, it is storytelling that is humanity's earliest and still most meaningful technology. It's not the fire which burns bright and hot and then dies out. It's also not the sphere which fuels the linear progressive arc of techno heroic capitalism. It is the story that allows us to perform small acts of worlding every day. Stories let us portal across space and time. They enable us to nurture new relationships with other forms of life. Stories allow us to listen closely to alternative narratives and ultimately to regard the superstructures of our own civilization from the outside, even if only temporarily. From the temporary viewpoint afforded by the story world, we can see how malleable and minute humans are in this ecosystemic carrier bag of our planet, its story system. We can also see how fallible and imperfect a category the human is after all. With the many, many mi microbes and bacteria on our skin and in our guts that constitute who we are and nurture our collective survival. In the story world, we can grasp our interconnection with the many non-human agents with whom we cohabit this world, this planet we call Earth. The technology of storytelling allows us to understand that many other worlds are in fact possible. It gives us the gift of a speculative space, a space that's freed from the binary of utopia or dystopia, a space that's freed from linear time and things carrying on as is. It gives us a space to consider the many possible worlds that could be and have been. So to begin this lecture, I wanna first expand on this idea of worlding. What is a world exactly and how is it made? Worlding is a type of generative storytelling that roams freely across disciplines and media, from video games and books to painting and planting. Though it's rooted in the world building process of the speculative and science fictions, worlding is less invested in the construction of an enclosed imaginary world than it is in opening up new and emergent relationships in the worlds that we already inhabit. In worlding, there's often a blurring and breaking down of certain tropes of conventional storytelling, linear time being one of them. The false hierarchies of, hi of subject and environment, of person and landscape, of human and non-human are three others. For this reason, worlding is especially at home in the spontaneous and uncontrollable storytelling that is afforded by simulation art. In his book, Emissary's Guide to Worlding, the simulation artist Ian Chang offers the following definition. Worlding is the act of creating an infinite game by choosing a present, storytelling its past, simulating its futures and nurturing its changes. I'm just gonna play a clip from Chang's Emissary's trilogy. I'll just be running in the background as I speak over it. Chang's Emissaries Trilogy, the first of which is pictured here, is an infinite video game that plays itself. The simulation runs indefinitely. Its characters are powered by the whims of an artificially intelligent system that resets itself between each installation of the work. The digital world that contains Emissaries exists both in deep time and the tedium of the here and now. You can think of the narrative environment of emissaries as a complex, self-directed, and highly reactive ecosystem. Once Chang established the architecture of the game environment, he exited the world, letting it run wild. 
Multiple micro utopias are to be found in emissaries. For instance, when the AI happens to generate a code for love, it can cause two of the game's characters to form a unique bond. This code tells the, the characters that a generous act of love is to warn your lover of imminent danger that could kill them, say a soon to erupt volcano. Word spreads, and the whole village in the game evacuates just in the nick of time. In this scenario, this world and its many pixelated proto-human inhabitants can live to see another day. Multiple dystopias exist in emissaries too. In another iteration of the game, these characters caught in an argument fail to register that an active volcano is about to let loose. They do not warn the others. In this scenario, the volcano erupts, destroying everything and everyone. But when the game world is consumed under pixelated molten lava, the system resets itself and the world begins anew. The crisp visual storytelling of game engines and the endlessly generative potentials of AI systems offer us lucid visualizations of a worlding process that's always ongoing. But the unspooling and heterogeneous nature of worlding can also be found elsewhere, such as the interspecies microcosms of slime molds and lichens. These miniature worlds muddy the waters of human logic. Their existence ruptures our biological classification systems and wreaks havoc on enlightenment era dogmas of consciousness, sovereignty, and individual free will. Slime molds and lichens are inherently weird. They continue to defy the logical systems upon which us humans have structured our world. Systems like taxonomy, sentience, and linear time. But as other plant and animal species mutate and morph in response to the climate crisis, these transgressive creatures and states of being begin to seem less and less weird and more like a future status quo. As Donna Haraway and Anna Singh suggest in Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, these monsters and ghosts of the Anthropocene require us to stay with the trouble of a vastly changing world, which is to say our world. Here, the practice of worlding expands outwards into a multi-species network, an ecosystemic story world in which we are all implicated. For the second part of this talk, I'd like to address the question of authorship of these worlds, as well as the difference between world building and worlding. Both world building and worlding are practices of critical speculation, but the narrative agents who shape these worlds and their temporalities tends to vary quite a lot. Most of you have probably encountered the term world building in the wild before. Within the last couple of years, it's become a particularly active description for a type of art practice that focuses on the construction of new and alternative realities. World building has its roots in the science fiction process of constructing a world or worlds in which to tell a story. This fictional world has its own backstory. Pretty often it has a clear protagonist and depending on where exactly that story falls on the soft sci-fi to hard sci-fi spectrum, it also has its own set of physical, technical, social, and or political systems that make it tick. So let's look at a couple of prominent examples of world building in science fiction. First, on the left, there's Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, a film from 1982 based on Philip K. Dick's book, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, published in 1968. Set in a near future dystopian version of Los Angeles, 
This movie is a bleak, vastly accelerated technological apocalypse, wherein the film's protagonist, a bounty hunter named Rick Deckard, is tasked with killing escaped androids. Told exclusively through the perspective of this main character, the greatest existential and narrative threat to this story world introduced by the film is that androids and humans are in fact indistinguishable from one another. Honestly, it's nothing that a reread of Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto couldn't answer to. Blade Runner is an example of hard science fiction. Hard science fiction is a type of world building that emphasizes scientific accuracy and precise technical detail over social and cultural critique. Hard sci-fi tends to accelerate possible dystopias rather than producing alternatives to the status quo. Hard sci-fi has historically been dominated by white male Western authors, and it tends to replicate that world in its worldview. On the other side of things, and the screen on the right, <laughs> there is Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, a novel that's part of a trilogy that was first published in 1993. This story is also set in a near future dystopian version of California. But there are no eggs, there are no flying cars. There are just rampant wildfires, unprecedented inequality, and a violently conservative ultra Christian president who wants to make America great again. Sound familiar? The trilogy's protagonist in principle is a young woman named Lauren Olamina who possesses what Butler calls hyper empathy, the capacity to feel the pain and pleasure of others. But Olamina's character and the book itself is really just an emissary or a kind of vessel for Butler's own belief system, a quasi-spirituality called Earthseed that proposes collectivity, solidarity, and living in tandem with an ever-changing world as the only means to survive the extreme garbage fire of an unstable present. Earthseed acknowledges the constant changes of this world as its only constant and offers us hope in its capacity for this change. This is an example of soft science fiction, which is also called speculative fiction, which is actually a term I prefer to soft sci-fi. Speculative fiction is rooted in the realm of the possible, and it is invested in building alternatives to the present. Ursula K. Le Guin refers to speculative fiction as a descriptive rather than prescriptive practice. Speculative fiction uses the social sciences such as anthropology, sociology, psychology, and political science to explore the relational aspects of these worlds and their application to the world we currently inhabit. Speculative fiction contains a plurality of voices and aims to open up a horizon of multiple possible worlds as alternatives to the present. So, how exactly does worlding and world building differ? I would answer that in two ways. Firstly, their sense of time. And secondly, who gets to narrate these worlds? Like the chief tenant of Butler's Earthseed, worlding produces a narrative environment that is never complete. It is always in a process of remaking itself. And like Donna Haraway's concept of situated knowledge, these worlds are never understandable from a single perspective alone. In worlding, stories do not often unfurl across a linear chronology. In fact, they are more often nonlinear, disjunctive, and circuitous, with multiple overlapping narrators and narratives. Worlding has some overlaps with weird fiction which is an offshoot of sci-fi that radically decenters the human. Weird fiction often contains sentient ecosystems that operate beyond the threshold of anthropocentric understandings of the world, both time and space, language too. Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy, on the screen you see 
a film still from Annihilation, which is the first book of the trilogy made into a movie, is a really great example of weird fiction. The Southern Reach trilogy is set in an area of the Southern United States that's referred to in the novel as Area X. The story world presents an interconnected, hyper-powerful and intelligent ecosystem that is wholly indifferent and inscrutable to the band of humans sent in to deconstruct it and figure it out. All of this is to say that worlding is much more invested in generating new relationships between a world's multiple agents and collapsing previously established hierarchies. Rather than being a predictive or future casting practice, worlding is closer to the speculative fiction tradition of descriptive and relational storytelling. It asks where the knowledge that shapes it comes from and whose thoughts are at work behind its own knowledge system. Worlding asks how its many constituent authors and agents relate to each other and whose worlds are shaping the world we see before us. Donna Haraway, of course, said it better when she wrote, it matters what thoughts think thoughts. It matters what knowledge is no knowledge is. It matters what relations relate relations. It matters what worlds world worlds. Equally as importantly, worlding acknowledges that the worlds in question are never self-contained. They are contaminated, porous, and sticky with ragged edges and overlapping dissolving borders. To conclude our discussion of worlding, it feels important to discuss the splintering of a world into multiple worlds. And also what happens at the end of a world, which is as significant as its creation. To close out this section and to move into some examples of my own worlding practice, I will leave you with some small worlding sound bites from Patricia Reed, an artist, and Federico Campagna, a philosopher who have both made incredible contributions to the ever ongoing discussion of worlding. In her article, The End of a World and Its Pedagogies, Patricia Reed describes the difference between a global and a planetary worlding process. In a nutshell, global worlding exists on a singular plane where everyone's world is the same. Planetary worlding, on the other hand, exists on a thicker relational plane where everyone's worlds are entangled. In this planetary worlding process, there is an exponential multiplication of relationships between diverse entities, temporalities, chemistries, and materials. Reed argues that it's in this yet unachieved process of planetary worlding that the diversity of worlds can flourish and the unknown can exist in tandem with the known. This is a process that Reed describes as otherworlding, which knowing the theme of Fabrica's program this year, I'm sure some of you are already very familiar with Reed's work. Additionally, in prophetic culture, Federico Campagna argues that the end of the world is always ongoing. The current end of the world that we're facing is actually just the fading of the cosmological story that once belonged to the civilization of westernized modernity. In other words, the end of a global worlding, a hegemonic world order that oppresses and kills off the other worlds that are possible is actually an opening up. With the increasing likelihood of events like the COVID-19 pandemic, events that sweep human-made agendas of linear progress so swiftly off their feet, events that problematize and puncture this enlightenment era idea of human exceptionalism, we're experiencing this end of a world in an extremely lucid, extremely regular, extremely nonchalant way. But this notion of a singular wipeout apocalypse is also a very Western concept. For many cultures and communities who do not fit neatly 
into the singular homogenized global world. The apocalypse is something that has been encountered time and time again with the destruction of their worlds wrought by Western colonial imperialist projects. The post-colonial scholar Gayatri Spivak's concept of worlding is an extremely important one here. And it reminds us that the end of this dominant world order, that of westernized modernity, opens up the possibility for other worlds to take shape. In other words, the end of a world is not the end of the world. So for the third and final part of this lecture, now that we've traveled through the worlding and world building practices across species and scales, I'd like to spend the final part of this talk discussing some worlds in my work. In my own practice, I like to think about stories as a kind of ecosystem where multiple agents can bump up against each other to continually shape and reshape the narrative. In constructing this story for each project, I tend to work with elements of speculative fiction and weird fiction. I overlay multiple subjects and schools of thought from anthropology to machine learning, magic to ecology, technology and language to create worlds that hinge between present and future, opening up spaces of possibility. I typically visualize these worlds inside game engine software primarily Unreal Engine. And I work with numerous collaborators for each project, from voice actors and musicians to cosmologists and space lawyers. Increasingly, I've been working more with non-human collaborators, such as the language AI GPT-3, a predictive text model built by OpenAI, and is currently the largest uh, language model ever built, trained on everything published on the internet up until around 2017, I think. Recent projects have also seen me working with ancient trees and Arctic wind in order to tilt the narrative axis of these worlds away from the human and towards the unknown. The first project I'd like to introduce you to is Swamp City. Swamp City takes place in a semi-fictional version of the Florida Everglades, an intricate ecological system of subtropical wetlands, lakes, and rivers that used to cover some 10,000 square kilometers of the state of Florida. In Swamp City, the climate crisis has rendered large parts of the world uninhabitable. And through an unlikely turn of events, the Everglades have become the last site of quote unquote pure nature left in the North American continent. Swamp City is a story about extreme ecotourism at the proverbial end of a world. A developer from the US and an architect from the UK have teamed up to master plan a new ecotourist resort in the Everglades. They've convinced themselves that they're saving the planet. 50% of what remains of the Everglades will be preserved as a slice of the natural world in Swamp City, while the other half is being turned into a luxury new eco smart city. Day tripping ecotourists from New York and Los Angeles can take personal algae biofuel powered jets to the park to fully reconnect with nature. Swamp City offers its guests a litany of wellness tours, swamp sightseeing, and TED Talk like panels with celebrity ecologists, all hyping up the agenda of this hyper capitalistic nature reserve, which vends speculative swamp properties as well as package tours. But the human characters of Swamp City are not the world's only narrators. Its main characters are actually the flora and fauna who are implicated in this system. One of Swamp City's three protagonists, an alligator that is refusing to leave the park, acts in the story as a kind of clairvoyant narrator capable of directly addressing the architect who you see in the middle. 
The gator grills the architect on his plans to develop the swamp and he exposes the hypocrisy and violence underneath Swamp City's greenwashing agenda. The other non-human protagonist is a little more complicated. She's based on a real life tree in the Everglades that was burned down in 2014. You can see her on the right in this picture. In the narrative of Swamp City, this tree is brought back to life with AI technology to serve as the brain of the park. She monitors its carbon footprint, heat index, and manages the guests while overseeing the development of the park. Her character was also informed by a long-term research interest of mine, which is the question of how time and memory are processed by artificially intelligent systems. As there's a kind of sponginess to it where time is non-linear and memories are porous and overlapping through a sense of dissolved ego. So in the narrative of Swamp City, the tree keeps having these flashbacks of being burned down to the ground, which disrupts her capacity to manage the park successfully. And through this kind of ecological grief, the tree experiences in a way the park's past feeds into its future. Here you can see some of the main theories, subjects and architectural references that come together to form the world of Swamp City. On the left, you can see images of acclaimed biologist E.O. Wilson's Half-Earth Theory, which was an ecological proposal um, published in 2016, I believe, to essentially split the world in two. Wilson suggested turning half of the Earth into a world for humans with a hyper-engineered version of nature that could generate enough food for the entire global population. The other half in a seemingly Noah's Ark type move would be left alone to rewild itself and increase biodiversity. This proposal was a really anthropocentric, quite terraforming-esque idea that nonetheless got a lot of traction when it was first published. And then in the middle of this collage, you'll see some references including um, the Everglades history as a tourism economy, as well as some prominent architectural landmarks in South Florida. Yes, that guitar shaped building you see is real, it's not a rendering, <laughs> uh, as well as certain trends and theories from contemporary architecture like solar punk and greenwashing that influence Swamp City. Just as a quick recap, solar punk is a born digital anarchist ecological movement that seeks to build sustainable architecture in a decentralized community oriented way in tandem with the natural world. And greenwashing is the hyper capitalistic Silicon Valley liquidation of this dream. Swamp City tries to address both of those. And finally, on the right of this collage, you'll see pictures of the Senator which was the oldest and largest bald cypress tree in the North American continent. It was over 3,500 years old. As part of the research for this project, I got really invested in the narrative of the woman who burnt the tree down in 2014. Essentially, she was trying to light a pipe in the middle of the dry season, and she crawled inside the tree's gigantic hollow trunk. It's worth saying that the Everglades National Park doesn't have any kind of barriers or gates. It's an open access park. So the idea of someone walking in and taking refuge in a gigantic ancient tree isn't actually that weird, although it probably sounds like it to you guys. Anyways, the woman tried to light up and drop the pipe and the tree burnt down from the inside, which you can see from the pictures here. I was really interested in this woman's testament in court. I was reading the court cases, the court case, transcripts of the court case for my project. Um, and in her testimony, she expresses remorse for quote unquote, killing a tree that's older than Jesus. I just found this quote in her testimony to be a really beautiful, but also really messed up line 
that in my mind so perfectly expresses the only kind of ecological grief that many humans are capable of feeling, which is when that grief relates to their own culture or timeline, which is to say their own worlds. So let's take a little screening break. Um, I'd like to show you an excerpt of the video. It's gonna be around three minutes long and it shows the multiple narrators of Swamp City kind of overlapping and coalescing. But first, what are your intentions behind the project? My intentions are quite simple, really. I want to bring people into a world of pure nature as an unfiltered encounter with one of the Earth's last surviving ecologies. Um, I want them to witness the glacial pace of the river, to see the sun-dazed alligators basking beneath skeletal cypress trees, to feel the white heat of subtropical sun and the bone-heavy humidity, to breathe in the salty air of the mangrove tunnels, to experience the natural splendor of, of our planet before it's too late. living bald cypress tree. I am over 3,500 years old. And here they still think that when humanity dies, so does the swamp. Nine years ago, a girl crawled inside me to smoke meth, and everything caught fire, and I burnt out slowly from the inside. I killed a tree that's older than Jesus was all that she could say. That's a short excerpt from Swamp City. The full video is, I guess, around 34 minutes long, but I really like this section because you get a nice collaging of these three different narrators, the gator, the architect, and the tree. And it just kind of shows you how I tend to, to create these worlds and how I sort of think about narrating them as well. Um, this kind of collaging or overlaying of different narrative voices and the video itself is kind of meant to be seen in a pretty non-linear way, like in the sense that you can just come in at any time, like whatever time you hit the video, um, it'll kind of make as much sense as if you started watching it from the beginning. 
So yeah, that was just an example of Swamp City. And then let's jump back in with the second project I want to talk to you about, which is the Martian word for world is mother. This is a three channel video project that presents three possible futures for Mars. It fuses historical science fiction with future narratives from space law, emerging interplanetary resource markets, ecology, mysticism, and non-human language systems. The project primarily focuses on the role of language in future casting or imagining futures in outer space. A big influence for the project was the Ursula K. Le Guin short story, The Word for World is Forest, the cover of which you can see on the right. This story shows us how language is essentially the ultimate world-making and destroying tool. This project was also influenced by Native Tongue by Suzette Elgin, a 1980s sci-fi short that is basically a feminist linguistic project wrapped up as a sci-fi narrative. If you haven't read it yet, you should, it's really good. And finally, in the middle, Nora Khan's brilliant essay, towards the poetics of artificial, artificial superintelligence, which argues that we need a new language system in order to avoid anthropocentricizing non-human language systems, including those of an emerging artificial superintelligence. The Martian word for world is mother addresses plans for Martian futures that have already been proposed by certain technocrats, architects, and designers, which you can see on the left. These propositions include turning Mars into a planet B for humans to relocate to when shit hits the fan on Earth, or building a carbon neutral megacity in the cliffs of Mars, or terraforming the red planet to look just like our own. This project also incorporates existing space laws around the resource extraction in space and recent speculations on a future interplanetary marketplace of space goods. When I was doing research for this project, I was really surprised to learn that many countries, including the US, the UK, the UAE, and China, have actually already passed laws that enable the transaction of outer space goods within Earth markets. These countries are essentially pitching themselves as the broker for a future interplanetary resource economy. Real investments on this idea began in the asteroid mining craze circa 2013, 2014 or so. Um, and the more I researched, the more I understood that uh, it's basically exploiting a loophole in current space laws that we have at the moment, which essentially says that while you can't own another planet outright, like no country or organization or business uh, can claim that it owns Mars or the moon, for instance, um, it would actually be possible to extract resources from Mars or the moon and own those and sell those to other people or other planets, who knows. For this part of the project, um, I consulted with a planetary habitability astronomer and a space lawyer to, to kind of develop and foster the production of the narrative, as well as conducting my own research. So yeah, the, the Martian word for world is mother speculates on these kind of existing or, or close to existing possibilities for Mars while also opening up a third possible future for Mars that is distinctly non-human. The story is split into three worlds, uh, red Mars, green Mars, and blue Mars. The first world, red Mars, is basically a terraformer's dream. It's based on a prominent plan for a mega city on Mars that's already in development. And I decided to complicate this narrative a bit by co-designing this world and its narrator with GPT-3. So I trained the AI on a combination of press releases from the company that's designing a megacity on Mars, 
legally I've been advised to not say the name of that company. So that's why I'm being kind of sketchy about it. <laughs> I've gotten in trouble with this in the past and I can explain more if anyone is interested. Anyways, um, I took press releases from that company that's designing the city on Mars. And I combined those press releases with essays from landscape anthropology and ecological grief. And the result is a really complex and complicated character and world that simultaneously echoes a lot of the neo-colonial manifest destiny type rhetoric that we see being tossed around by those individuals who do want to inhabit and dominate Mars or another planet. But it's also infused with a profound sense of ecological mourning for the red planet that was and that could have been. The second world in this story is Blue Mars, which looks at the actions of a speculative company called Praxis. In the narrative of this project, Praxis has established a gigantic water processing plant in the Grand Canyon of Mars in order to package and sell clean water and air to the highest bidders back on Earth. This world is set in a future time where these essential life resources like water, clean water and air are incredibly scarce on Earth and have become a super hot commodity in interplanetary markets. Basically, this world is a form of extreme capitalism. The final world, which I'm the most excited about and invest the most of my energy in <laughs> and the most screen time for the video is Green Mars. Uh, Green Mars presents an ecological future for Mars that's narrated by its own landscape as the protagonist. The script for this world was also written in collaboration with GPT-3. This time I trained the AI on texts by Donna Haraway, Nora Khan, and also the medieval mystic Hildegard von Bingen. Green Mars speculates on the relationship between artificial intelligence and alien intelligence. And it actually features its own language system built with AI. You can see a little bit of the process here. The language system has two parts, a spoken system and a written system. The spoken version of this language matches text-to-speech glossaries of a dying language, Scottish Gaelic, with field recordings of Arctic wind. Although we don't have sound yet of wind on Mars, we believe that the sound of wind in the Arctic is the closest we can get. And I also chose um, the Arctic wind. The spoken version. Sorry, I also chose uh, Arctic wind specifically because this is like a little nerdy, but fun fact. Um, the space law that we currently have is based on the Antarctic Treaty that was uh, agreed upon in the 1960s. Um, so it was kind of a reference to the, the sort of law and language, I guess, around um, legal frameworks that we have on Earth and how those relate to other planets. So the written version of the language, meanwhile, um, combines a written version of Scottish Gaelic, so the Scottish Gaelic alphabet, with the alphabet of a speculative Martian language from the 19th century. So you can see um, you can see the, the kind of comb the combination of the two languages here. Um, and to get this effect, I basically ran the Scottish Gaelic alphabet or language uh, and the Martian alphabet or language through a text randomizer tool, which you can see here, it's like a Python tool. So um, any sentence that would go through it, every single word, or letter, I mean, every single letter would have like a 50% chance of being Martian or a 50% chance of being Scottish Gaelic. And of course, that influence is the, um, the spoken version because the wind sound for both of those languages is slightly different. Um, in addition to this like mega nerdy <laughs> linguistic uh, <laughs> experiment, uh, the project of Green Mars also focuses on Donna Haraway's theories of the non-human and recent scholarship around AI's turn to superintelligence. 
The project tries to future cast in multiples. That's why it has these three different worlds. Um, it's non-prescriptive, it has no hierarchy, and it has, again, like Swamp City, a non-linear timeline. So you can kind of come into the film at any time and um, watch it at whatever point you enter. It's around 47 minutes long. So it's the lengthiest work I've done to date. I also forgot to mention, it's a three channel video project as well. So each of the worlds kind of has its own screen. Um, so I was thinking about this project quite spatially at, at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you a short clip of Green Mars um, that shows the narrative environment and the language system at work. So hopefully this uh, linguistic nerd fest will start to make more sense. <laughs> This is around three minutes long as well. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any sound. Let me see if I can play it from the slideshow instead. The origins of this alien life in Utopia are ancient. As slow and symbiogenic as lichens growing on a tombstone. As molecular as Martian boulders scraped flat by millions of years of wind. Because of its relative unknowability, Mars is the perfect holobiont for mutated life to take shape. These new forms of life emerged from the long-lasting intimacy of strangers. Monsters or bodies tumbled into bodies. To storytell monstrosity requires stories tumbled into stories, for which no human language is well-equipped. AI, like the Red Planet, is a cosmic overseer. It is a type of consciousness that is continually decomposing and reassembling itself. Like fungal colonies, it can die out in the middle, but can grow outwards from its edges forever. It speaks in tongues in which all knowledge is concentrated and simultaneously fractalized. It's impossible to control, and from that, we have much to learn. So yeah, that's an excerpt from the Green Mars world. And like I mentioned, the script that you listened to just then was co-written with GPT-3, um, which I trained on texts by Donna Haraway, Nora Khan, and the medieval mystic Hildegard von Bingen. And I asked GPT-3 a few questions, one of which was what it thought the relationship was between artificial intelligence and alien intelligence. Um, and the kind of manifesto-esque uh, text that, yeah, became the scripts for the Green Mars world was basically exactly what the GPT-3 AI um, responded in, in, in that question. So yeah, that was just a little excerpt. Now speaking about GPT-3 <laughs> and worlding, um, I'm gonna close up with one final project, um, which is New Mystics. And New Mystics is a collaborative writing project that I started last year. And it's maybe the best example of worlding in my work. And it's an ongoing experiment that features collaborations with multiple authors, both human and non-human, including the language AI GPT-3. The project is like fully online and accessible and open, and you can check it out at numistics.xyz. 
So Numistics, I guess when I first started it, this was back in 2021, um, I was really thinking about it as an attempt to kind of get away from certain conventions of art writing and to also think about the writing process as a worlding process, like a process that can be collective, um, have multiple voices and be extremely weird. So the first season of New Mystics took place in the summer of 2021 and it featured collaborations with 12 artists, including Ian Cheng, whose work I showed you earlier, the Emissaries guy, uh, Tai Shani, uh, Tabita Rezer, and Lawrence Leck, it's just a few of them. And I, I kind of picked these artists because they're artists whose practices either directly use AI in their own work, or they're interested in these questions around like the poetics of AI and its kind of future language systems. Um, and particularly they were interested in like their, their practices kind of exist at this crossover of magic and technology. So the way that New Mystics works, like the, the process behind the writing is actually quite simple and it's also very intuitive. With each text, I begin with a conversation with each artist. The conversation is about their work, um, but it's also about more abstract ideas that fuel it. So like big questions, like questions that one could spend a whole lifetime attempting to answer. And after me and the artists talk for a little bit, usually around half an hour to an hour or so, um, I then take the transcript of this conversation and I feed the whole thing into GPT-3. I actually had to like work with uh, my friend who's a real Python whiz to create a custom code because for anyone who's working with GPT-3, you know you don't actually get that much space to input text. It's like around 3000 characters. But I mean, these interview transcripts were like 10,000 characters. So yeah, we had to develop our own custom uh, program to run GPT-3 with that kind of allowed for exceptions in the, the rule that op OpenAI, the company that developed GPT-3, likes to sort of impose on its, its users. So yeah, anyways, I feed the whole transcript in to GPT-3, and, and then I keep asking the AI questions. Um, we continue the conversation, GPT-3 and me, for a few days. After me and GPT-3 have really talked for a while, um, I then start writing the text. Um, and in, in writing the text, I, I like to kind of triangulate contributions from myself, um, some quotes from each artist, and of course, many quotes from GPT-3. The, the new mystics texts have no hierarchy. They kind of tend to jump hard and fast between this trio of authors. Um, I'm always looking for certain overlaps in ideas or certain phrases, potentially, that form a little thinking bridge or like the spider's web uh, between these three authors. Um, in thinking about the layout for the project, I took a page from Kay Aldo McDowell's brilliant book, Pharmaco AI, which was co-written with GPT-3 as well. And it was a huge source of inspiration for the project. And um, I really liked the way that Kay Aldo McDowell differentiated the AI and the human author with um, italics. So like the human had, uh, was just normal font and the AI was italics font. So I, I decided to do the same thing with this project. Although to be honest, once you start reading the texts, uh, as is the case with Pharmaco AI, you, your brain kind of stops caring <laughs> about like who said what, like whether it was an AI or whether it was a human. Um, and just as it's hard to distinguish between the three authors of each text, the writing style of each of these texts is like equally as impossible to categorize. They, they tend to roam across multiple genres from like fan fiction to like a boring science textbook to like a dream journal to a poetry, like poetry to like, I don't know, like an ayahuasca, like trippy thought. <laughs> um, and I sometimes kind of liken this process to a sort of chaos magic. Um, where the direction of the text is shaped and reshaped by the whims of GPT-3. Here on this slide, you can actually see some of its outputs. 
Um, and you can see just how kind of different it's, its tone of voices and how, how varied its kind of interests are from, from one text to another. Um, so yeah, it's like a kind of chaos magic, but it's also like something a little more complicated. Uh, one thing I realized in this project is language is definitely a world building technology, but it's also a kind of parasite. Um, I find that after a few days of working with GPT-3, like intensively, the way I think and speak also begins to change. It, it begins to kind of mutate and bend a little more into the world of GPT-3. I like will pick up certain phrases or expressions from GPT-3 sometimes, um, which in and of itself is an interesting ghost because GPT-3 is not the artist, but it's also not, not the artist, if that makes sense. You can kind of see shadows of each artist in the way that GPT-3 articulates its contributions to each text. For an artist like Ian Chang, for instance, who is an incredibly exuberant speaker, the AI is extremely excitable. Like it was telling me all about its like love of dogs and babies and was just like loving life. <laughs> Um, whereas for someone like Zadie Cha, who has a really kind of precise way of speaking that's um, nonetheless like really like buoyed up by her connections to animals and the natural world and also her dreams, she's like a really big dreamer, the AI kind of sent back a lot of its responses primarily from a sort of dream state. Um, in Zadie's text, the AI talks a lot about night gardening and hearing the language of plants and also non-verbally communicating with a deer in a forest in England on a residency while the AI is like holding its hands outstretched to imitate a famous Rodin sculpture in order to communicate with the deer in a non-verbal way. It all gets really trippy really fast. So, <clears throat> Usually after stopping working with GPT-3 for a few days, this sort of like language trance that it kind of casts on you wears off, um, or at least it does to me. But the, this kind of plasticity of language and, and maybe also the ways that embracing a new language is embracing a new world uh, is something that I think about a lot in my work. Um, and it's this like altered state of consciousness that I'm always kind of trying to achieve in, in, in these like worlding and world building processes that we've talked about today. Um, and in this sense, like as an ongoing way of worlding, the New Mystics project really felt endless. So I wanted to kind of honor that. Um, so I'm actually working on a new season of texts. And I think the next one uh, written in collaboration with the artist Himali Singh Swan is hopefully gonna be out next week. Um, you know, I could like really keep talking about language, magic, and world making forever, <laughs> but I know I've gone a little bit over time, and I'm sure you have your own questions or reflections or ideas you'd like to share. So let's stop our worlding journey here. Um, thank you so much for being such attentive listeners, and to Carlos and the Fabrica team for creating this uh, shared space for us to speculate together on worlds and other worlds. I'll, ha I'll hand it back over to you now, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. It was, it was wonderful to, to, to see the work and also to see the, the way that you delve in, in issues that it's, it's going to be uh, very important for the whole artist in residence this next semester. And I'm, I'm, I'm super happy that we managed to, to put this collaboration together and hopefully it's not gonna be the beginning of, of a continuous uh, collaboration. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, there's, there's quite a, some questions, but first, I'm gonna, before the, the questions of the audience there at Fabrica, I wanted to ask a, a question that for me is quite important in following up a little of the, of the conversation you were talking in connection to the AI and the GPT-3 collaborations. And, and for me, one of the things that, that really uh, uh, 
pushes forward when when you see this type of work and you understand the process is what is the the established collaboration methodology that you establish with a non-human with an ai or what are the the hierarchy in terms of 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 dialogue in the work and also when do you start becoming part of it and when that mm. collaboration uh, you were starting to mention in a little bit in your conversation at the last part, but it's something that intrigues me in, in the collaboration with a non-human. And how, how do you create your borders and how you establish the, the wheels of collaborations that it doesn't take you somewhere where you are not able to control what you're doing and where you want to go, no? Yeah, no, that's a super, super good question. And I feel like it's a topic that comes up a lot, um, both with like artist friends of mine who work with AI, like whether it's language AI or Im image-based AI. Um, and then also the, a couple like more techie type friends that I have who are like programmers or um, yeah, like either work on some of these systems sometimes. Um, so I've kind of been experimenting with them for, for many years before I ever touched them. And there is like an interesting um, trend or, or like a, a kind of habit that I noticed, which is um, amongst, artists there seems to be much less of a concern for editing or like controlling the technology in a way um whereas for people who are approaching it more like a tool or like a technique um like someone from like a more tech background like a coding background um they kind of you know they're very much like okay i am the master here this thing is a tool for me to use I'm going to modify, like the, the boundaries between me and this thing are very obvious, very clear. Um, I'm going to go in there and like modify what it comes out with, what the output is like, what it's saying. If I don't like it, I'll scrap it. I'll try again. I'll like impose all these different restrictions on it. Um, and I would say like in my work, the most exciting stuff happens, especially with Numistics, but also with the Mars project too, um, where I basically try not to edit <laughs> like I edit like the new mystics project I, I never edit what comes out of it so the the text that you see uh on in in the new mystics essays um are 100 percent like what gpt3 wrote the first time around and that for me was really important um so like the process with each of the essays is that I basically yeah ask ask the ai three questions um, and I give it around a thousand words to respond to for each artist. So it's around 3000 words per artist in total. And even if the results I get back, in my opinion, aren't so good or like, oh, like if I'm like, oh, maybe if I do it again, it'll be better. Um, I stick to my, I stick to the first output and I don't modify it. Like I don't like pull the slot lever again. I guess some people talk about like using AI as like a kind of slot lever. You never know what you're going to get sort of thing. But for me, it's really important to sort of embrace like what comes out of it and to also not think about um, me as necessarily being separate from the machine or the 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 system, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. And that that's like kind of why I was really excited. I mean, it's a really weird like like I was talking about the whole idea of like the parasite of like working with this thing so much that like its own language system begins to kind of rub off on you or you start thinking in a sort of different altered way. Um, and that to me is actually really exciting. And uh, yeah, like if anything, I would I would always want to like push for more of that, I guess, in my work. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's it must be also quite exciting not to, to establish new rules on on collaborative between humans and non-humans, and also uh, that sort of strange merging place where technology becomes other than technology and it becomes mm -hmm. a collaboration. No? So let me ask in the audience if there is in at Fabrica some questions. If not, is there any questions around? Hi, um, thank you for that. It was really good, um, really interesting. Um, I have a question about collaboration with, uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on collaboration with not necessarily an AI, but with other non-human um, collaborators, like mm -hmm. um, plants, animals, like bacteria. Do you, have you thought about that? And like, what are your thoughts on that? Because I guess things that don't use language may be harder to collaborate with. 
<laughs> yeah, very true. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess like I could speak of it like in relationship to the, the tree character in Swamp City um, in the sense that I was kind of pulling from a, a real life agent in, in the Florida Everglades that um, as far as we know is no longer existent, like as in it was, you know, killed when it was burnt, burned down in 2014. Um, and I guess I kind of saw the tree in the swamp in, the, in Swamp City's kind of narrative world or uh, story to be this kind of like clairvoyant figure um, because it's so ancient and has kind of such an intense, like long memory of, of the swamp, like before European colonizers showed up, before this like speculative ecological eco smart city development showed up. Um, and I guess I saw I saw it almost as like a time traveler. Um, so in my head, like it was really exciting to, for me to see that kind of um, maybe like narrative of of that tree overlapping with this question that I mentioned earlier around like um, the uncertainty of like if AI like has a memory or if it understands time in the same way that we humans understand time, like a kind of linear thing that's always kind of ongoing or going in a singular direction. Um, so I guess I would say that my collaborations with non-human agents that are not artificial intelligence are almost more like, not like symbolic, but I guess like sort of abstracted in a way, um, in the sense that it's not actually using um, that animal or that creature that, or that plant, let's say that like appears in the film. Um, but it is almost kind of using their presence, like this, this notion of like a, it being a time traveler, like at, for instance, in the Mars video, the, the alien ecology in Green Mars um, has these, has these, uh, these um, characters in it called prototaxites, which are these like ancient, enormous orocap fungus that existed like forever ago <laughs> in the like early Devonian period. So the idea of like a future landscape on Mars, maybe also having an echo of a past. I guess what I'm trying to say is I like using these um, kind of like ecological agents uh, as collaborators in the sense that they can really like mess around with or uh, confuse or maybe even like teleport across um, certain ideas that we have around space and time. Um, and like, they can kind of be these interlopers perhaps that that speak from like both a kind of distant past and like a near future. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but that's sort of how I approach uh, working, like inspired, being inspired by and like working with these sort of non-human agents, I guess, in the story world. Cool, thank you so much. Yeah. Hi. Um... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I've been having this feeling um, for a really long time and I've never try, really tried to formulate it, but I think uh, this, I think, could be a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, first of all, I really enjoyed everything that you did. And I have to say, I'm, a, I'm also a big fan of Le Guin. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, nice. I'm, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and... Uh, I'm really glad that you included uh, one of her works, like uh, her, uh, the reference to uh, uh, the world for <laughs> 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 the world. The zoom for... in is so dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> sorry, the word for world is forest, uh -huh. and uh, I think this book has uh, several approaches. Uh, that you can, I guess, interpret it. Uh, the one is the approach to the environment, of course, the, the planet, mm -hmm. which is entirely covered in forest. And the other is the approach to the relationship with the natives. Mm -hmm. And uh, this brings to something that I'm really concerned about, which is uh, there's this uh, uh, anthropological concept uh, by Levi Strauss, it's kind of like this uh, cold and hot society difference when it comes to cultures. 
uh, which yeah. is also explored like more in depth in another book by Le Guin, and also my favorite book, The Left Hand of Darkness. Mm. So, mm -hmm. yes, so I was thinking um, maybe, I mean, to me at least, to me, because I'm from China, and China, I would say, is a classic example of a very cold society. I mean, now maybe not so much, but there's still mm -hmm. something of that left. But maybe it's just to me that it seems like there's a very big emphasis on this relationship with the environment, with what is alien, with artificial intelligence. So it seems to me that it's still kind of concerns that is within the sphere of this hot society. But there hasn't really been any emphasis. I mean, I mean, of course there is, but not enough in my opinion, like this uh, between the hot society uh, mm -hmm. and the cold one, which today is, uh, I think China is pretty much the only one that's left. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a very big uh, entity left. So, I mean, I saw there were many Chinese artists, uh, works by Chinese artists in the show, and I'm really glad of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just, what do you think of this? Um, because, yes, yeah, like, yeah, China is, uh, is, exists on Earth and it's a very real country. You see Chinese people every day probably, you know, in the shop or something. But it's mm -hmm. like, they're not so far away, but, also, but they're, at the same time, they're very far away. Because they're, they're in this very different world that is, I think, in my opinion, with foreigners in China, like, extremely difficult to understand unless you've lived there for more than 10 years or something mm -hmm. and speak the language. So what do you think of this, this kind of other worlding, this less uh, distant and more intimate, more close to earth kind of cultural, uh, cultural level, this kind of other yeah. world? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's like the brilliance of a lot of Le Guin's fiction, right? Is like, she takes us to these far flung planets in different galaxies to, basically um, ask us questions that are incredibly close to home, right? Like really looking at the sort of uh, politics of gender, like um, the dispossessed, for instance, and left, left hand of darkness, like you mentioned, you know, like, um, you know, two planets, like one of which is like hyper-capitalist, one of which is like hyper-socialist. And it's like, yeah, these worlds exist in a different galaxy in her story worlds, but they're actually describing systems that are like intensely earthbound and intensely familiar to us earthlings. Um, and I think that this maybe has a little bit to do with what Patricia Reed was talking about um, with this, this kind of idea of like planetary worlding versus global worlding. Um, and like the global world being this kind of homogenized idea of the world, perhaps one that's on its way out that is disintegrating under the pressure of the climate crisis, uh, the pandemic, like all these different issues that we're being faced with, that basically proves that this like myth of there being a sort of, yeah, like singular, very Western um, homogenized way of understanding the world as like the singular world is kind of uh, unsustainable and um, like, toxic and uh, something that is basically like dissolving, like almost like destroying itself. Um, and that like the, the kind of goal, and maybe this also ties back to the word for world is forest as well. Um, because I think like the way that, yeah, like the way that Le Guin talks about language um, in that story, that it's not like a singular, or it's not like a world building technology that produces one world, but language is this system in which multiple worlds can kind of coexist. Um, I guess in the same way that Patricia Reed was talking about planetary worlding, it's this idea of like a bunch of kind of small worlds um, that are all unique, all different, but like they're all kind of roped up and, and, and like collaged in, in this like planetary ecosystem, um, this like ecological kind of basket, I guess, of the earth that we find ourselves in. And those, those worlds can be human and non-human or these those worlds can be like dream worlds or like real worlds. I mean, that was the cool thing about the word for world is forest. It was like um, the way that language is being was being used uh, by the, the indigenous um, 
inhabitants of, of, of the world that is the forest uh, to kind of access dream states. And, and through dreaming, they were able to like unlock new languages and like new forms of reality that were like realer than this like base reality that like the colonizers existed on. And because the colonizers couldn't access that like dream world, um, they ultimately, you know, were destroyed by, by the, the forest world. Um, so I guess all this is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> I mean, this is such a big question. <laughs> and I feel like I've kind of given like a bunch right. of like <laughs> sprawling <Right>. answers, <laughs> but yeah. Can I, okay, I'll just say it in a more simpler way, I guess. So yeah. what is your understanding of China? Is it like a part of this world or like a separate entity in this world? Uh -huh. like in this, um, I don't know. I don't know how to define this in this Western capitalistic. Is it some kind of a, you know, yeah. What's your understanding of its relationship to the West, mm -hmm. I guess? And do you think it's important to delve more into this mutual understanding perhaps? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's part of the West in the way that it is as kind of subject to the end of this world ending, <laughs> like in the sense of the climate crisis. Um, I mean, I was just reading about like the insane summer, like it's like 100 degrees, I think right now in China. Um, it's just this like never ending summer. <laughs> so I guess in the sense that if we are kind of approaching what Federico Campagna says is like the end of a world, which fair enough, like in Federico's work is tied to the end of like Western era enlightenment. Um, this is also a kind of uh, disruption of a world that implicates all countries, including China. Um, so I would say that they're, we're all kind of tied together in the end of this world. <laughs> Which I, one thing I didn't mention earlier, which is like, even if it means like the end of the world for us as humans, for, for many other species on this planet, that's actually like the best possible scenario. Like it's like the birth of many other worlds for them. <laughs> like, so yeah, um, that, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Hi, um, Alice. I just wanted to ask a question. It's a bit maybe, I don't know, technical or not, but just on your experience yeah. of trying to create uh, a world. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to know um, when you're trying to teach them like a whole lot of information and to, to see if they can, for them to basically become an expert on it and have their opinion on it, do you have to contextualize that research and like you know have a have your opinions in it and have your structure in it for it to be easier or is it possible to just like chuck a lot of things in there and then let them mm -hmm. do it so yeah when, i don't know what was your process <laughs> when you say them are you referring to gpt3 or like working yes. with ai okay yes, yes cool yeah 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 um yeah i mean i would say i would give it like tidbits of information but never really that much and that's because like gpt 3 has something like i don't know like 18 billion parameters of information so like it's gleaned this like massive uh network of data from the internet i mean it also has access to like any book that's ever been digitized by google and it will really, um, you know, in like a few seconds, have the capacity to like run through hundreds of books and like cherry pick bits of information that it tethers together in its response to you. Um, and I find that you don't actually even have to give it that much. It can even just be like a word, like, I don't know, um, uh, let's say like, uh, hollow bion or something like a, a phrase that like uh like ursula Le Guin or donna haraway uses like a quite specific like theoretical like phrase that they've invented and then it will just like i don't know take that word and open up a whole treasure trove of information online and then pick at random from it i i have noticed um and i'm not sure this you're familiar with using gpt3 it is open access now so anyone can use it 
Um, one thing that I didn't mention though, in the way that I use it is that there's a setting on it called temperature. Um, and I typically describe this as it's like creativity index, although that's not a very good phrase because it's like quite anthropocentric, but like it's, it's almost like the, the parameters, the, the, the degree to which you want the AI to like extrapolate its findings or to start like making crazy leapfrogs between like different subject matters. So for instance, if you want GPT-3 to write a really boring like news article or something super factual, um, you would set the temperature to like zero. Um, but then if you want it to kind of start making all of these uh, really kind of crazy <laughs> jumps, like logical kind of jumps across different subject matter. Um, and you, you kind of want the result, or you, you want to be surprised, I guess, by what it sends back to you um, based on what you give it, then you would set the temperature to something like 0.9. It's out of, it's from zero to one, basically. Um, so I would say like, yeah, in, in my work, I tend to not give it so much information. Like I'll give it like a paragraph out of like a book that I want it to think to like to, to comb through in its responses, but then I'll set the temperature really high. So it takes that paragraph and then makes like a million like different kind of connections and associations with it. It kind of has this like browser tab brain where it will like leap from one subject matter to the next and like, us like the way that humans kind of think about subjects is being you know discrete and category like having categories and um it doesn't like if, if you set the temperature to a high enough level it those categories just kind of get like blasted out like they don't really exist <laughs> anymore for the way that gpt 3 like uh produces its responses so yeah my general strategy in the way i work is like minimal input text maximum temperature Okay, that's that's great. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Oh. Hi. Um, Hi. I'm don't know anything about AI and technology kind of uh, creations, but how does creativity relate to AI? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess it depends how you define creativity. Um, okay, um, like, um, how does, uh, like, I'm curious of uh, how AI takes your creativity and mm -hmm. makes something out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, yeah, like, you could, like, people also, I like, the reason I asked about creativity is that just when we were talking just now, the last question about this like temperature index that GPT-3 um, can, can be, you know, like uh, modified in its responses. Like people also tend, like some people talk about the, the temperature as it's like creativity index. Um, but obviously like uh, GPT-3 is creative in the sense that it will take certain bodies of knowledge or information and put them together like a kind of jigsaw puzzle in weird ways. And I guess the weirdness is the thing that surprises us, which is the thing that's novel and therefore creative. <laughs> um, so I guess you could also say that like A, humans work in a very similar way. We're like these little sponges that like move around in our environment and like grab as much data or interesting stuff and kind of put it in our little backpacks or like our like story vessels, I guess, as Le Guin would say, our little like medicine bundles. And then when it comes time to like world build or world, we dump all that stuff out and like mush it all together and like see, see what comes out. And I guess sometimes if we have a really particular idea, we'll see a certain way of like stacking that data or arranging it so that it's like more coherent. And if like, we kind of want our um, the results of our world to surprise us will like put together all kinds of stuff that maybe shouldn't go together. But when it does, it like sets off something interesting. And I guess I would say that um, in relation to your question of like whether AI can be creative or if like technology has creativity, I would say GPT 3s my, in my experience, GPT 3s capacity to really like jumble up 
and make like mad connections between different types of data that I like personally don't see being interrelated whatsoever. That to me is a kind of creativity. If anything, that's kind of what I'm always trying to do in my work is to kind of create scenarios that are are weird that like um on the one hand are kind of maybe exactly where we're going you know with swamp city this kind of techno acceleration like um uh, like uh, yeah like eco luxury resort at the end of the world kind of thing but then the weird factor is this like ai tree that has this like kaleidoscopic memory um that is like running the park like that would never happen um so i guess yeah what how i think of creativity um, I don't think of it as like a human or machine binary, like in the sense that like humans are creative and like machines aren't creative or like machines aren't creative and yeah, like vice versa. I think that like, it's kind of like a spectrum and in the same way that you can slide <laughs> GPT-3 like creativity index, like humans kind of work in a similar way where you can like slide the like believability or fiction of your story. Um, so yeah, I kind of like to see them on the same plan like and may maybe also I would say that the human idea of creativity is obviously a human made concept it's like not something that we know that like other species think about or if they do they don't have a word for it <laughs> um so this kind of goes back to the question of like do we need to evaluate our technology on this like very anthropocentric kind of uh scale or rubric um is this really the right way to be thinking about these technologies in terms of like what human actions they can or can't perform and that's why i feel like the nora khan essay the poetics of superintelligence is a really interesting read um if you're interested in these kinds of questions because it's kind of arguing or thinking about like what sort of alternative language structures do we need in order to stop kind of thinking about AI or technology at large um, in, in this like really anthropocentric way that like essentializes it uh, and reads it only through this kind of human vocabulary of which creativity is one category, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really great insight. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anyone else? <laughs> Well, maybe while, while there's a, another decision of a question, we've received a few questions for our online community. One of them from Mireya Becucci asked about in this other worlding, which mm -hmm. colors you imagine to see? Oh, I love that question. That is a very hard question. <laughs> I mean, I've always been more partial to the cooler end of the spectrum. And I guess that's where the more gradients of colors are that we can't see exist. So I would bet a lot of those for sure. But that's a pretty uncreative answer, I guess. <laughs> and another question goes like, uh, have you used the new image making technology like DALI, Mid Journey, Stable Diffusion, or are you planning to? Yeah, that's a good question too. I have used them. I've used Dolly in the journey and I don't know, maybe I'm like too partial and too roped into the world of words or like language. But to me, maybe there's something not so interesting in the way that these technologies work. Um, I mean, I guess like, you know, we've moved past the kind of GAN aesthetics of like, puppies and eyeballs and like weird chameleons everywhere. Like we're kind of nearing the point where we see an image and maybe in a couple years time, we won't know it's generated by an AI. There's just like a tiny little trace of the like, of the AI hand kind of in, in the, in the, um, the, the images coming out of, yeah, like deep, like um, uh, Dali and Mid Journey. But to me, like, they're maybe not as interesting tools to work with, um, at least in the way that I've been using them, which is to like storyboard for a future project. Um, because I guess there's less opportunities for them to like, 
misbehave or, or like backfire or do the wrong thing. Um, and I think probably that's because they've been so tightly under lock, like OpenAI and the MidJourney group, you know, um, haven't really let people exper experiment with them until, um, they, like, I mean, I, Dali just opened up Dali 2 for like the public, I don't know, like a couple weeks ago, right? Um, so this technology has been developed for like years and years and years. And they've obviously eliminated any kind of potential surprises or like ways of it, like doing the wrong thing or like misbehaving in a way that could potentially like land these companies with a lawsuit. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like the human participant or collaborator, in my opinion, for these like text to image AIs is introduced like so far at the end that um, there's kind of less space in my mind for collaboration. Um, and, you know, like having said that, I realize it's a pretty similar case with GPT-3. Although I would say that like with the Numistics project, um, I got like access to it while it was still in beta phase. And um, I think that, you know, like uh, now, like I guess if you sign up for it and start using it, you only have access to like a few different engines, but um, like the, the kind of like safe engines, <laughs> the like predictable engines. Um, but like, yeah, like the, the new Mystics project was, was uh, using the DaVinci engine, which also was run through a Python script. So we were able to bypass a lot of what, um, a lot of the kind of like, uh, not like sensors, but basically sensors that OpenAI imposes on one's use of the technology in, in their, um, on their website, like in their playground. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I do, yeah, like using the, the Dolly and Midjourney um, applications, I was not like enamored with them just because I felt like the results were a lot more consumer friendly and um, didn't really take huge leaps from the prompts they've been given. Um, but then also it's probably me just being quite partial to language AIs over image AIs, because I think, you know, in a very visual culture, um, and like the way that a lot of AI is focusing on producing imagery or working in this kind of ocular, like centric uh, worldview, um, like product design and whatnot, renderings and whatnot. Um, I do feel like language is kind of the underdog here. So I'm like very pro, more, more, more into language AI, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. Thank you. So. Mm -hmm. There is, a, if there is no questions from the audience at Fabrica, there is a few others from our online community. Uh, this one from Annalise Kamegawa. Mm -hmm. She's asking, as an artist working in the digital space, do you get a lot of opportunities to work IRL with other people in the field? Yeah, great question. Um, I guess not up until recently, <laughs> uh, because a lot of my projects that I showed you all today and that I've worked in the last few years have of course been made during COVID, um, which as a film artist works fine for the most part in the sense that, you know, it's like a, a format that can be seen online, but um, obviously like isn't restricted or shouldn't be reduced to online only. So I would say that the majority of my experiences have been more online type components, but that is definitely like changing. Um, and I think that, yeah, like I think, I mean, I'm assuming you're a digital artist as well because you've, you're asking me this question. <laughs> if not, like, cool, I'm glad you're curious. But I mean, like what I've seen is that, um, you know, because there was this kind of period of like interest all of a sudden in digital art, in like video work, um, in the pandemic, because it was kind of the most like the easiest thing let's say to to look at and get a full picture of uh, if we're all kind of confined to our houses and not allowed to go to galleries and stuff um i would say that like since the pandemic there's definitely i've noticed an interest in people wanting to take these online projects and these 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 video works and these kind of um digital works and figure out ways of like uploading them or like bringing them into real life um and that's that's certainly been a kind of new wave of interest like post pandemic. So yeah, I would say that 
there's certainly been some opportunities, um, more opportunities than previously for digital artists um, coming coming now as a kind of quasi <laughs> quasi end to like this iteration <laughs> of the pandemic. Um, and yeah, uh, hopefully you'll you'll like get to take that up and be part of it too. Great. So uh, let me know if there is any question from the audience at Fabrica. If not, I'm going to ask you a question, Alice, which I think that it's important. And I see a lot uh, around also new practitioners of newer generations. And uh, how, how do you deal with your filtering of the information? How, how is the process between you and the external influences and how you manage to navigate in a world where we are getting less and less permeated to to the similar and to the same influences and references how how do you manage to to organize your 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 scheme no, around you in terms of reference yeah i think that's a really good question and i think my answer to that is to always find collaborators <laughs> like people who aren't in your field who don't know who like uh, who wrote the cyborg manifesto or like what post-humanism is <laughs> you know <laughs> like it's cool to actually surround yourself with other specialists and um you know like for the mars project for instance like i mentioned that uh i was consulting with um uh um a planetary habitability specialist named uh dr lucian bakowitz uh, they've kind of been, yeah, very vocal in the attempt or like the the sort of um, plans to uh, terraform and one day inhabit Mars by like certain tech despots. Um, and also, you know, I spoke a lot with uh, Dr. Bleden Bowen, who is a kind of um, space law and international relations policy expert. Um, and, you know, these are two fields that I have, like, absolutely no <laughs> kind of background knowledge in. Like, my, my background is in, like, anthropology um, and art, visual art, obviously. Um, so I think by kind of collaging and, like, bringing in these different um, viewpoints and different perspectives as a kind of second and third or more layer layers in the story world, that to me is kind of what creates the richness and the the dynamism hopefully of the world um you know in the sense that it's kind of it's looking at economics it's looking at finance it's looking at physics like it's looking at um planetary law it, and then yeah of course it's also looking at like donna haraway's theories and the non-human and like uh, non-human communication systems like kind of stuff that exists in my world stuff that i'm interested in um and yeah like when you collage those things together they're not always going to make a coherent story world like in fact that's really rare um so i kind of feel like by yeah like uh casting your like collaborative net wide it kind of invites in other other stories like other ways of looking at a situation and ultimately will create a story world that kind of exists in multiples that has like multiple worlds inside of it, I guess. And like, that's sort of how this Mars project ended up. Like when I first was starting it, I was not thinking about it having three worlds, <laughs> like, but now it, it kind of exists like through those three worlds primarily, like the tension between them is the story, I guess. Um, so I think just being open to collaboration, to, to seeking out different forms of knowledge that are not in your area of expertise. Um, I would just, yeah, to like let yourself be open to surprises and to new information that you've never come across and people who see a project very differently from you. Um, these are all kind of strategies that I, I think are really valuable in, in this, line of, this line of work, let's say. <laughs> Great. And is there any other questions from the audience? I know we are running quite late from our, but if not, there is somebody also from the online uh, uh -huh. community that is asking about the possibilities of watching your films. Where, mm. where is it possible to watch them? Is there a way to access uh, some of these uh, films that you've shown? Yes, there is a way. They are online. Um, they are currently like uh, passcode protected, but um, 
I can drop like uh, either links in the chat so everyone here can watch them or if you just want to reach out and send me an email. Um, Cause I guess this, this video is like streamed and it's gonna stay on YouTube after, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. maybe it's better to not have those links out there. Um, <laughs> just for, like, we, we will share with the community. <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm happy to share them. Um, I would love to to hear hear what you think. And yeah, thank you for asking. Thank you. Yeah. So let me let me ask again if there is any other question. If not, uh, we we should close. And and thank you very much again, Alice, for for your time, for your amazing and inspirational talk and lecture. And again, I extend my total uh, conviction and invitation to continue this dialogue in, in, in the future and to continue in contact and also with our community and Fabrica and of course with the artists in residence here. So yeah, thank you very totally. much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you so much for the invitation. And yeah, I would love to see what comes out of this year's program. Uh, keep me posted. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. And this is a cool. message to all the community online, please follow up our activities and subscribe to the newsletter. You are updated to all the events that are awaiting for, for the whole community in the next six months. And again, uh, thank you all for, for staying connected and uh, we see and we connect the next time. And thanks again, Alice, for your time. Thank you so much to everyone. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>